Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for being here in the early session and uh, getting out of the keynote. Uh, I really honor that, really appreciate that. And um, yeah, today's session is about PowerShell 3.0. I got the first hints, hey, why don't you talk about 4.0? We'll talk about that a little bit later then. Um, my name is Rolf Masu. I'm working as a senior consultant for Microsoft in Germany, Microsoft Consulting Services. And um, before that, I was a PowerShell MVP. Um, I have created the German-speaking PowerShell community. Do this stuff for more than six years now. And hopefully I have some tips and tricks, notes from the field uh, from the last two years within Microsoft that will be helpful for you also for your, for your duties. So um, let's get into matters, into the business. You will not see uh, much coding in this session, but uh, if you have a special question, etc., we, we have the editor at hand and can do some little things, but uh, we will make it dependent on the time, obviously. First of all, thanks to our sponsors, uh, especially for the last one last night. I think some of you them used that very excessively, and they are not here yet, <laughs> um, but uh, they will be, and I hope they will survive with the help of little drugs. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, we've seen this slide a lot, of, but uh, the, this doesn't diminish the thank to the sponsors for having this. Okay, I've got two customers that I want to talk to about uh, with you. Number one customer is an engineering company. Engineering company that is a global player. And you see uh, 20,000 seats. They have done a migration from Novell. When I came there, it has already nearly finished. They were just collecting the last uh, departments throughout Germany, throughout the world. Uh, but the main uh, was already, the main stage, stage, stage was already set. Um, Going along with that, they did put in some file services. And, uh, but their standards, their uh, processes, etc., they were not 100% there because what they did while they did this novel migration, a little bit beforehand, they did some uh, consolidation of services, etc., and they were not yet there, but they needed to migrate, and therefore it was a little bit on the move. Um, so the file service itself needed a little bit of optimization. They were not 100% sure. They had a li large file cluster, etc. How to handle it? They knew Novell, but Windows file services, not there. Um, when I say large file clusters, we're talking about several, several, several terabyte with a storage area network in the background. They have a five node cluster with some whatever amount of resource groups behind it. So it is even in our uh, definitions, a larger implementation. But you can see, no PowerShell now. That's the reason why I came in. No, kidding. They had issues with the cluster, and uh, I have a little bit of background on that also, and they said, okay, come in. <clears throat> Scenario number one, the mechanical engineering company. Um, that was last year, and uh, this year, this additional customer uh, showed up. It's a public sector company. Well, I say company, but it is a public sector. And you know that they are always a little bit in the issue with not enough people or not the right trained people. Money is always a thing. And yeah, but this time we have a domain consolidation. Domain consolidation going from 15 domains, child domains, into the root domain. Um, the structure is well spread around the world, I think. From coming from NT4, having uh, everything joined into a uh, Active Directory domain, and then they have okay, let's go as a child domain be, uh, under the, the parent domain, etc. You find it very often, and it was in the box very often, as far as I can remember. And after uh, a certain time of year, uh, they said, okay, we need to consolidate. We need also to to bring this together for common services, etc., etc. Even the public sector says it now. Um, they have 400 plus domain controllers, 2003, and the plan is, and we're doing it actually, going to 2008 R2, and then I already can see the question marks in your faces, why not 12? As I said, it's a public sector. They make their decisions, and after two or three years, the thing will take place. Means, um, yeah, uh, the decision was made while well, the product 2012 was not, was not yet available. Mark, please.
broken. Um, I think everyone noticed a jump from XP to 8.1 in the public sector, and I'd like to know how you managed to convince them on that one. Ah, good point. Good point. Luckily, it was not me. <laughs> but. Uh, the decision was made also before I came into the project at all, and um, we have, um, they, they have an, an architect, two or three levels uh, in, the, in the hierarchy above the level I'm working at the moment, and he is uh, a very keen, a very sharp-minded guy who says, okay, that makes sense. Um, we are not going to Linux uh, because we are in Munich area or whatever, uh, but uh, no, I haven't been in the sales discussion with him, but uh, when I came there, this decision was just made. I can question that, and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have the precise answer. Another one, yes? You have mentioned that the uh, public sector have made this slow to get the service, but they tend actually to be quite fast about the senior of Good for you, good for you. <laughs> but our sales cycle in public goes around three years somewhat. The decision, another three years, implementation is done. Decision, yeah, so it takes a while. Um, you see the numbers? Um, they got uh, uh, questions by us. Hey, what about your domain admins? How many domain admins do you have? And you can imagine with 15 domains in there and a lot of dispersed things, they had a lot, and we all agreed that it was a little bit too much. So uh, was one of the things we needed a delegation model that works and uh, leaves enough space and enough room for the people to actually, that actually do the work, that they can do it, but they don't have the domain admin rights. So this comes on top. We've got 50,000 seats, plus a little bit. We've got uh, 30,000 clients, because not everybody is concurrently there. Um, you already saw the 8.1. We have a little bit of an offset for this track. It's one big project. First is AD, and after a little while, uh, the 8.1 rollout will start. And last but not least, no internal PowerShell. Yeah. That was the reason why. No, I think I said that. Let's go to the first customer now. The first customer, when we came, first come in, they had issues with their, with their performance on the clusters. Um, they already had this multiple node thing. A uh, little sketch was um, they had just one resource group and they had 40 plus disk resources and some thousand plus share resources. And whenever they did the failover, guess what happened? They took a while up to the timeout of the resources. And then they called us and said, Something is weird here. Can you please help? And um, so we had this failover, resource groups, several of, of the disks. They were just not mounted. And you, as the techies, who maybe have a little bit of knowledge in the file and clustering area, you know the timeouts uh, and the provisioning of the disk can take a while if there are too many in the resources. Mm, too many disks means uh, we had to do something. And the solution is, we need, a, we need a, a new design for how many resource groups do we need, how many disks do we assign to the resource groups, etc., etc. But it was a working environment already. There were these 20,000 people hitting this cluster, and we needed um, some on the fly readjustment in the background, in the maintenance windows, some of the at work and the other stuff uh, doing concurrently while the, all, the, all the other things were running. Please, Mark. 24 yes, global data. Yeah. Uh, so we needed our maintenance windows, and we needed uh, a good plan what to do and have it fail safe done in the maintenance window only, and have the preparation for the work on the maintenance window done beside without interfering with the actual, actual service. So it's enterprise level, definitely. The result. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, say again? Uh, yes, yes, I can give you the PowerPoint presentation on that. <laughs> now, I put it here on a certain purpose. I was there with a, with a colleague, and I, um, he did most of the, of the scripting. 
I, I was on the on the uh, parallel project uh, project in that time, and therefore I was not coding all the time, but reviewing the code. So he made the initial design, having a script for this, a script for that, and writing down what to do, etc., etc., etc. And also, you laughing. Why did you laugh? What, why don't you like it? Huh? Please. Okay, so why did you laugh then? Looks nice. Hmm. Promise. It's so many scripts. It's so many scripts. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Not, yeah. not many. Oh. Have a look. Um, yeah, I think I'll that. But it has a readme. Yeah? So we already provided a little bit. Now, uh, the, the fact is it has a little bit too many scripts and um, brings up the question of reusing the code, brings up the question of... Do you know the, the order in which to run the, the scripts, etc.? Yeah, please. A couple of things. Uh, indeed, I you're pointing out, but I was kind of keen on understanding the CMD versus PS1 and what you want, needed to put in the CMD. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, first thing, and uh, the CSV DFS link uh, PS1 is kind of interesting. Mm, Why the power, would you within the on? CMD, you just have the PowerShell exe, and you put in some parameters for the PowerShell exe uh, to run this uh, script. And maybe with this script, you have uh, the parameter values that go for the script. Uh, you have that in the, in the CMD file. But the uh, execution policy was uh, set to sign, remote sign. It was not a way to get around the remote. Uh, when you start the exe, the PowerShell exe, you can uh, also provide the execution level in which it should be run. And therefore, it was not a problem. But um, some of the administrators have the tendency to just take the PS1. And definitely, they hit this sweet spot. They did. Yes. Okay. So right. the, the policy had not been changed to the standard policy. Right. As I said, the, all the processes and standardization in the company was not yet there. Okay. And guess what? Even they had no policy in place for PowerShell to be treated uh, what is a uh, secure source or not. Just the same thing. Yeah. But I still like this as a sample. Yeah. Yes, you can be successful. Yes, you can do it. Um, but the lessons learned from that implementation, it worked as designed. And we needed a little bit of holding him, guiding him through the process, and uh, we were able to do it. What we did with the solution was we created several more resource groups, as many as we needed, and we made a definition not more than five disks per resource group that we can easily swap these resource groups from A to B. But uh, what this needed to be done is um, look at the big resource group in the beginning, select which of the disks go to the new resource group, which shares go along with that. We, didn't know to, uh, we did uh, not need to copy the data because they were on the disk already, but we had to move the disk from resource group one to resource group two or three or five or whatever and recreate all the shares. Yeah? And um, that was, yeah, it worked as designed, reusable, yeah, with some effort. You read into the scripts, you pick here and there, but it is not intuitive, definitely not. <clears throat> if I look at the scripts today, after what, one and a half year, what the heck did I do there? So um, you need a good documentation or yeah, better put it into the scripts what you need to do. <coughs> Errors, Errors did happen. We ourselves did not always run the scripts. We were on telephone support because they had nice maintenance windows, let's put it this way, and they didn't want us to have their sitting for uh, just holding their hands in the middle of the night just for it may some. Yeah, but they, they were in the need for, hey, there's some red code coming up, what shall I do? Uh, and they were not even able to read and understand what the PowerShell gave them as an error code. Um, and just say, error, oh, um, the error may have been, uh, mm -hmm, yeah, but they're administrators. So uh, it is a, a nice way to say uh, lack of knowledge. Now they don't even read the error messages. Error handling and logging. Yes, I personally learned a little bit more about how to uh, do the error handling within PowerShell from the technical way, but also how it should be done that the customer gets uh, the nice error messages and gets uh, details that he just needs to know and not the, the pure PowerShell code. It's 
more or less anything about try and catch and the finally statements, elements of the language you may have heard of. Um, so um, yes, you need to log. Log it to files, log it to uh, event log, log it to the screen that somebody gets a, a visual indication about the error, etc., etc. But don't omit it. This is what I wanted to bring out as lessons learned. And that one. Enjoy. There are some things in the implementation that were, oops, oh, I should have told you. Um, for example, oh yes, that location. We needed to do something about the share permissions here because they, ah, they, we had issues there. And the, uh, the uh, result was the script that was executed remotely uh, had no chance to do anything there, etc., etc. So um, uh, we, we found something, um, wrong NTFS permissions, wrong share permissions, etc., or uh, large, large pathers uh, that were an issue and uh, uh, what we did, we had one central management migration um, station, and we did some remoting, uh, telling the cluster, do it yourself from A to B, not uh, piping it through uh, the, the management station. So the remoting issue was also there, that we were trusted um, computers, trusted machines, that doing all the stuff. So, uh, yeah, <clears throat> and this was also not implemented correctly, and, uh, yeah. So these were the most things we learned out of that. I know I have not shown you any code yet. Shall I open the PowerShell just to make you feel convenient? No, we're kidding. Did, did you think we have a chance? Hmm. Maybe, yes. Maybe as a, as a doc, I know you don't want to show too much. We have, we have some code. We have okay. some code, but I will not interact with no, that. Okay. Yeah. I have to somehow um, make sure that we have a deserved a level 400, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, rehoming of file cluster resources. Same customer, and after we had fixed this issue, etc., um, they have every of these shares um, in DFS, distributed file system. So, what the end users say, I need a file share. I need a working folder in the network. This is what the end user says. And effectively, it is a share on the cluster, uh, a folder on a disk, right? But this is a disk of the cluster. And um, they have quotas on it. They say, I need 10 gigabytes. After two weeks, he calls it, can I have 50, please? And what the normal process is that the uh, administration now says, okay, where on the, uh, and he only knows his DFS share, right? Uh, where on all of our Many, many disks is this folder. Has this disk the remaining 40 gigabytes available, or is it already eaten up? Can I give this to him? And normally it ends up, damn, I have to move it. Huh? So uh, you need to go to another disk, have the folder structure copied there in any means, if, uh, in, with any tool, have the share of it, have the share into the DFS again, and uh, then tell the customer, can you please hold back for a moment? We're just moving. Give me a sh uh, short uh, show of hands. What do you think? How long does it take for this process? Identifying, okay, moving. We cut out the moving later. And building up everything again. And then, now you're ready to use your 50 gigabytes. Who says it is less than half an hour? Okay. Who would say it is two hours? Nobody. Okay. Say again? It depends on the size. I didn't get that. Depends on the size. Oh, no, no. We, we omit the time for copying. Just for getting through the process, identifying everything, and bring everything up. The, the copying is whatever solution you do uh, needs the same time. I think it's not possible to give a time frame without knowing the, <coughs> the infrastructure. Even, even on the same cluster, it took them three hours to work through the process from, I get the call, this is my DFS chip, please make it 50 gigabytes, I need a little bit more, up to the way, uh, say, the stick it itself, you've got the 50 gigabytes. Three hours. Much too long, definitely. And uh, so, three hours it needed, right? 
And the customer says, ah, including the delegation model, those people who are doing it, they're having too much power in their accounts. They are walking along with the, with the uh, X and go through the cluster. And uh, yeah, can we have something here? So first of all, it was about documentation of the process. They were not sure what the process is totally. So we uh, wrote that down for the customer. Um, and then we started to automate the process. Some of the code. Hey, I got you. <laughs> Some of the code that we did. Uh, the solution that you see here, the first lines, um, we created with PowerShell a graphical user interface, a window, a clickable thing, a window, etc., etc. But we didn't know, uh, didn't use any third-party um, um, graphical uh, IDE stuff. You may know the vendor. I think it's Sapien, isn't it? They're doing a quite good job on having this uh, please draw a little bit thing and then uh, you get the PowerShell code of it. Um, I don't prefer this approach because um, it is a one way. You paint these controls on the canvas and then you export the code. It is a very chatty code. It does Windows, uh, the old style. And when you want to change something afterwards, you start all over. When you have changed your code in between, yeah, you have to work around that. So my approach was, why don't we have Visual Studio, Windows Presentation Framework, just create a little user interface there, save the XML file, the XAML file, and leverage PowerShell to work with this thing. So always you can do in Visual Studio, do the... Um, adjustments in the surface, which we needed. We were going through several iterations here. And, and then uh, we were able to reuse the, the code, keep the code here, and have the layout here. How do I open up this stuff? Assembly, presentation framework, assembly, system. Just pull the assemblies into your workspace. Then um, some standard stuff that we are uh, using is Whenever you want to use a module, check whether it is available and give proper error messages back to the customer who is using it and do exit your code when it is not available because it's, you have to know what is the, the need for it, for your uh, script to run. Check it, check it, check it. Check all the prerequisites. Do I need a 64-bit environment, 32-bit? Do I need an elevator thing, etc., etc.? Check all this, and if you, f if you hit a, a heartbreak spot, Break there, give an error message. And uh, funny thing, I don't know whether you know it, when you use exit, the word exit in PowerShell code, in the ISE, do you know what happens? Does anybody? The, the ISE will close also. Not just your script that you want to close, but the complete ISE will close. So you may want to use break instead and uh, give a, a nice message, okay? So you can do it for every of your modules. Check it, check it, check it. Any resource that you need. Same here. Uh, I need to uh, put some icons and background pictures into this little um, into this, this little thing. So any dependent file I'm depending on, check the path. Make sure it is there. If it's not there, decide on your own. Is it a crucial error? Do I need to break? Or is it just a thing, okay, I can work around that. This is the way how you can do it and get the content of the XAML file. It's productive code, by the way. It is used at that customer, and uh, you can uh, work this way. So I have a working example for you at the end of the session, how that is done uh, with the URL, etc. Uh, so it's uh, one of the takeaways from today. Uh, and then you do a reader, and you see system, XML, XML node reader, and you import it into, um, into PowerShell. And from that on, you load the reader. $FSM is a file service manager. We just have this as a code and uh, put a background image, and again, test, test, test. Make sure everything is available before you use it. And uh, for those of you who have heard this thing, if you're doing PowerShell, you don't need to do programming. <laughs> Bodo is a programmer. He's allowed to laugh. Uh, and yes, you are allowed to laugh also. It develops. Well, the larger your scripts get, the more it is like a software project, definitely. So, and then this is the way how it works. You can do things with, the, with this little uh, application. At the end, you have one function, generate the form. 
and you walk through this XML file and you search for named elements of this XML file. Means uh, find name, button close, um, object button selection data, home, DFS link collection, etc. I put in some uh, randomly here. There's a lot of more, definitely, because there are more controls in there. And uh, then, whenever you want an action to happen, PowerShell says have the function before uh, in the code, and then you can use it. Same here. You have to have your uh, function elements above, and um, then you can add the events. For example, add click. If you have the button, you add the click event that you may know from Visual Studio. And this click event is just this dollar button close click. And this dollar button close click is just this one. Close the form. This is the way how it works. Okay? And uh, at the end, you do the show dialog. You uh, pipe it out to out null to have some, some uh, cleanup effects here. Um, while you're developing it, you may want to omit it to see some messages, error messages, etc. So this is final code stage. Okay? I hope you like it. Questions so far? Afterwards. Okay, good. Mark, please. Uh, I have a working example and uh, I can show it later. Yeah. And give it to you, definitely. Okay, lessons learned from that. Lessons learned from that. It worked as desired. Hey! But this time with a smiley. Because what did I uh, do? I had just one script, one dependent file, means the XAML file, uh, sealed everything more or less like a container, and have just, in the ESE, just start this thing. So I took away the complexity from the end user, means ad end administrator, help desk user, etc. Et so this is the solution for this customer. You may find other solutions for yourself, but uh, lessons learned from the other things, too many scripts, I don't know what. This is what we did then. It is large. Show of hands, how many lines of code do you think we have in this implementation with this? Two thousand? Not the comments. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Productive codes of line. Yeah, lines of codes. Huh? It's, it's roughly at a thousand where you are. And a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of functions putting into the, the buttons actions, etc., etc. Cleaning up the form when you go back. And therefore, it is a software development project, even when it is scripting. Yeah? <clears throat> requirements engineering. When it is a software project, you need your requirements, you need your specs. Because we ended up, uh, we had a work breakdown structure, definitely. I, I said, I want to have that, what will be in the product and who will do what, etc. And they still came afterwards with new features that they want to have in the product, in the final script. I said, okay, yes, we can do that. Uh, please give us another five days, etc. whatever is needed. Okay, have that, because otherwise you end up uh, just struggling. Bodo, yeah. Um, make it transparent, because when you leave the customer, they may need uh, to port it to another system, or the system that you have it on crashes and they have to rebuild it, make the modules clear. Uh, this is part of the checking thing, uh, throw proper error messages, oh, I need this module, I need that module, please bring that into my path, etc., 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 okay? Mm. And document it. Always, this time, assume that something will happen. I use this word on purpose, because otherwise it will make, yes, you know what I mean. Uh, document, 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 please plan for good documentation. Inline document, you can have it after the, the, the code, just put a hash behind the line of code and say, something wonderful happens here, okay? Lock to screen, lock to event lock, lock to, this, uh, to a file, whatever is needed uh, for your own reason, for whatever. Yes, please. Uh, this thing was um, some 30 days of development. For Microsoft, yeah. Which is pretty expensive. But uh, what do you think uh, the final result was? We had the three hours. Just spoke to, we had this three hours. What do you think the final result is? How fast were they able to swap 
without the copying of the data, because it's the, just the same, without the copying of the data, how fast were they able to get from A to B? A minute. A minute. Fifteen. Yeah, I'd say between one and five minutes. Yeah. Between one and five, depending on if it was local on the site or remote on the site. So, trading that against the, the effort of the 30 days, um, after a while you come to a break even and say, okay, from there, now on it counts and makes it easy, etc., etc. We use the, the solution. But, fair question, yes, definitely. You have to value it against uh, your business. I think it was first or not. Yeah. And um, you said uh, 30 days. Mm -hmm. Does it include the first version with what you showed us? Uh, no, 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 that was something completely different. Okay. That was so just realigning of the cluster. Solution plus 30 days for this. Two different scenarios. Just was cleaning up the cluster, and after they had the cleaned up cluster, yeah. they came with a solution. Oh, that yeah, takes yeah, long. Okay, okay. okay, Mark, please. Your question? Yeah, the question regarding the 30 days of um, consulting. How much was dealing with the customer not liking red lines, the, all the documentation, all of the error handling and yeah, things yeah. that. To, uh, to drop it up, uh, it was roughly nearly close to 10 days of specs getting everything together and it was 20 days of coding, 5 days of all the error handling, doing it properly. No, no, it, out of the 30 days, 10 days for this, 20 days for coding, from the coding it was five days of doing all the error handling, etc., etc., etc. Okay, shall we proceed, or please? Yeah. And, uh, the time that you have to talk um, with the, with the that was the ten days before. Extra. That was the ten days uh, in the beginning of the ah, thirty okay. days to get all the specs, to get everything, to understand right. what he wants and needs. Okay. Environment. Okay. Next scenario. Ready? Okay public sector this time. Um, as I said, large migration, etc. And uh, demanding failback. They said, we're moving, but we are live. We're working at the moment. Everything needs to be kept in place. And if something happens, we need an immediate fallback. Immediate means less than 15 minutes. So whenever a user was migrated, didn't work as desired, for whatever reason, even if it was just a local reason, fail back, that he can continue after 15 minutes to, to use uh, the old account. Um, that was the main killer thing. And limited resources, public sector, as I said, they always are very limited, either money, either resources, time, whatever reason. Um, but, um, yeah. Uh, so, having this in mind, well, they said, okay, we need a third-party tool, and you may know one or two third-party tools that do a little bit of migration of Active Directory things. Please. Maybe, this one question, yeah. what do we migrate here? Active Directory users and computers and groups, what do you first? No, within the same domain, but I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. Get to that. Yeah. So, they, they have chosen a third-party product. I may have heard the name already. And um, then uh, still this solution they have leaves some gaps for the scenario of this customer. And uh, yeah, we ended up um, at some scripts to beef it up, to beef the migration up and make sure that everything runs like we intended it to run. Mm. So the target. It was a moving target migration. So while we did some, oh, there's a solution. Wait, there's a solution. Wait, where is it? Um, because what we have, we have one out of 15 domains. There's a user in there with all his attributes. And I'm, not, I'm just talking about the user. We have the groups in there and the computers also. And um, then we have this new user, which is a cloned user by this third party tool with most of the attributes. Most means in the middle of it, there is. The green thing, the identity management tool that they have in place, which is in place for 15 years, which does all the relocation of people from the one department to the other department, from uh, one city into another city, and what they end up is killing the user account in the one domain, create the user account in the other domain, etc., etc. So a lot of movement in the background in the, in the source area. This is the green part. 
Then we have this third party migration tool taking care of just, just uh, and synchronizing all of this stuff into the new domain in the one consolidated in, in the same forest, just the root, to answer your question. Yeah? And then we come with our cutover script and say, hey, come on, move. You're, oh, where are you? Yeah? So it was always a little bit of, hey, come on, please, can you hold still for a moment and we want to migrate you? Yeah? So, Mark, your question, please. Okay. okay. Um. So, as I said, most of the attributes were synchronized to the new uh, structure, but we left out some of the attributes, means uh, a home path, profile path, script path, user principal name, user workstations. We left that out because, as I said, we have a 2003 domain controller acting as a file and print server, multi-purpose, multi-dimension, whatever thing in one of the locations. And we need to replace it because it's a domain controller of the old domain. We replaced it for a 2008 R2 read-only domain controller. So all the users have got their user home profile path, whatever script uh, entry in their, in their user object. We need to change that because it is pulled away underneath and replaced with a new domain controller. And the files have to move also. So um, all these attributes needed to be adjusted to the new values. And the user workstations, we were searching for how do we avoid that the user it's synchronized, password synchronized. How do we avoid that he uses the new account already uh, beforehand, before he is migrated? So we just went to user workstations, put in the dummy value, and said, okay, please, uh, policies do not allow to use this account at the moment. And that means when we migrate the user, we have to take this off the new user account and put it to the old user account. So we, this was a cutover element, like a scale that is tipping from one side to the other. And uh, scripting pass, 15 domains, 15 system volumes with 15 login script versions and roughly 4,500 files in the combined sysvols. We didn't want to have that in the one sysvol of the new domain. So we chopped it away, got a share, a special share for every domain that was available and were able to bring it down to the to the login entries of the user, which means we just triggered a script.cmd uh, in the new domain and gave a percent one uh, parameter, which is a new pass for, for its legacy login script. So uh, we needed to take care in the cutover element for these attributes. The beginning. The beginning was something like this. <coughs> Requires, and it is exactly, hash requires minus version 3.0. If you want to have that the script is only run in that certain, ver certain version, you have to have this line. If you want to comment out this line, put another hash in front of this, then the uh, version requirement is omitted. Um, and you see something, square brackets, command and binding, round brackets, C4 parameter set name, blah, 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 all the funny things here. Um, what it does, it is a header. This is the start of the script. You can have your comments above. And the start of the script, uh, you can get help about it, parameters and function commandlet bindings. It makes a script behave like a commandlet. Having this little first word there, commandlet binding, um, takes your script and applies all the functionalities of a command to it. You get your default parameters, you get the default parameter sets, and uh, the what if, uh, verbose, etc. You don't have to code it yourself. And you can have a help um, URI in there if you want to point to a certain help uh, area in your, in your company or your customer's company, and uh, how it should work with um, uh, pipeline object that were put into your script, etc., etc. So that is a starter, a must-have um, to work on that level. And the next thing is let PowerShell help you. When you look at the first versions of your functions that you wrote, and also that I wrote, before we had these advanced functions, I had the thing that I ended up, I need a parameter. The parameter needs a value. I need to verify that everything is correct with the value I got for this parameter. 
Is it the correct part, etc., etc., etc.? Is it empty or several other things? Do I need numbers it's, and so on? And PowerShell has a chance with this param section to help you validating all your input stuff. And let PowerShell do the, the heavy load instead of coding it yourself and leaving little gaps of things where you not had time to do or were not thinking of. Yeah? For example, this uh, test path. Um, a path may have quotes. Maybe the thing that you use afterwards doesn't like the quotes. You will find out by the red lines that you get. Uh, so therefore, uh, when you want to test the path, you have to uh, replace the quotes and throw them out. And uh, the test path, for example, it does not need the quotes. So I want to make sure if there are any quotes around the string that I guess, get as path, throw them away, and then test it. Okay? So PowerShell in the beginning already helps me, and I don't need to uh, verify it later on. Okay? And also, again, get help about functions, advanced parameters, very nice thing to read about. And then you see something, parameter set name. Ever, anybody heard about parasita, parameter sets? Parameter set names, etc. Just one nodding um, to help you out. Parameter sets are um, put yourself in the situation. You want to have uh, uh, LDAP query, for example, and you want to search by identity, just the SAM account name, or you want to search by an LDAP string, etc. Um, you end up in the need for okay, I need. Uh, a certain parameter two, three times whenever I go for identity or for, for LDAP, for example, search this user on that server or use this LDAP string against that server. So that would make the parameter server redundant. You would code it twice. With the parameter set, you can have it once and have this one parameter added to the parameter set Go by user or go by LDAP name. When you look at the, at the online help of the get Active Directory user, you will find three lines, three parameter set. And whenever you pick one of the attributes of one of the parameter set, you're ending up with just three out of 15 parameters this command that supports. But it's enough for this parameter set to give you the proper result. And you can leverage that for your scripts. You end up coding less because your attribute, uh, sorry, your parameter is just defined once and then you can uh, reuse it in different sets. In this sample, um, I uh, have a migration file which has all the configuration that is needed for the migration of the user and I either, either say and take this bunch of people or take just one person by identity. And I have the common uh, value of um, the migration configuration file. Okay. Parameter sets. Structure. Please be kind to yourself. Structure your code. I talked about commandlet binding. Have it. I talked about param block. Have it. And now, have a begin, have a process, have an end. What do you put in the begin? All the things you just want to do once for your script. For example, some com object leverage things started up or some standard definitions of attributes, etc. Just put it up there. The process is for every object that you are doing work with. And the end is just a cleanup task at the end and roll up, putting something here and there or writing a log file at the very end. But it helps. It definitely helps to have this structure because you know for sure where to put things. And if you do it, be aware about the scoping of your variables. I am a lazy, lazy coder. I end up having all global, which I need global. I don't go for this and this and this and then debugging myself because I put it in the wrong place. Okay, so be aware about that. And uh, let's talk legacy. If you're doing a migration between a 2003 domain and a 2008 structure, you need to go legacy. So don't think, oh, I get the new user with get ad user. Hey, that's 2003. They don't have the service that you want to talk to. Okay? So you have to go old WMI, old ADSI, and these are just some samples. I'm pushing a little bit for the time. Some samples, how you can end up in your script, how to get a security descriptor. Um, get all the shares. 
means you get all the shares. It can be a lengthy list, and then you end up, for each item, look for up. Hmm, okay, maybe you don't want that. Uh, query, all shares were captions, and then you have uh, a little bit, what do I want to have? And see the quotes? Five quotes. This is the notation that you need to work with the variable in the select string for the WMI. It takes a while to bring somebody to understand that why it is needed. Therefore, I did say, hey, it may be useful for you to pick it and just reuse it in your code. Um, next thing that we have. Um, do a filter. Name equals, and then just the name. Okay? But what if you just have part of the name? Then you need to use the like thing. This is just find me the one. And if you, eh, I don't know, I just have a starting thing, you go and, for example, do the like thing. And then you find uh, your five quotes again. Okay? So different ways you get larger or less large result sets here. ADSI. You may have seen that. But that is productive code if you want to do the migrations that I've been talking about. And you end up, okay, module here, there, there, there. And then out of sudden, oh, my module is not working. Why? Because you're talking to an old legacy, whatever, AD. You have all the properties that you want to do, and then you just dig in. I prefer this way, get a user. But sometimes you just don't have it, OK? OK. Um, work remotely. Do your invoking. Do you know what invoking is really, and is the environment that you're working with really supporting the invoking? I talked about this. I'm sitting on one machine. And I tell this server to copy data from A to B. You don't want to funnel it through the management or tool server, etc., maybe over the wide area network, right? So you need to have some policies in place that support this completely. And then you can do this quite easy. But if you do invoke something like Dear Quota, an old Axie file, you may get funny results, language dependent results. And, you gen and then in the end, you end up uh, file uh, line by line by line, analyzing what is coming back, and split each line and say, okay, if I get this back, this means, okay, I get this attribute filled with this value, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so be aware about the results that you get from the legacy tools that you may need. Question? Got it. I think so. That would be a stupid question. I'm trying to think uh, where I, uh, what I forgot when I was asking that. Um, regarding the legacy on the previous slide, yeah. uh, would you be able to just add a single 2008 DC and run your PowerShell directly on that? Since Depends on the domain level that you have, domain functional okay. level, and then yes, you could, could have the, the services in there. And uh, you have also the Active Directory Gateway services okay. that you could put into the 2003 structure, yeah. but it also has limitations. I was able to nuke this, uh, okay. this interface uh, quite often because of capacity. Yeah. Okay. Um, one little bit sophisticated code that I wanted to, to give you. We ended up, uh, the, all the home shares of these 50,000 users, they went into DFS. And the customer said, I don't want to have a list of 50,000 folders on, in one structure. I said, okay, what else do you want? Do you want some geographical stuff or do you want some departmental stuff? No sense in it because uh, you will be ending up... Um, with uh, when there is a movement getting from one department to the other, picking uh, the DFS structure also away beside what is in the user and, and clean up the DFS. So they en we ended up, they have this uh, SEM account names with nine digits. So we chopped the SEM account name into its, its single pieces and made each of the pieces a folder in DFS. So whenever you pick on one of the numbers, you get, boom, 10 more numbers. You pick on the next number, boom, 10 more numbers. So that's the exploded hedgehog. Whenever you ping, all the rays stick out. And how you do that? Use PowerShell. It's a four dollar e blah, blah. Um, where do we have it? Where do we have it? Where do we have it? First line. Same account name, two char array. And then you have an array, and you can work on that array and put in the, the backslashes into this path. It's a working sample, and it's very easy to code in PowerShell. And then you can just create the new DFSN folder, and you have the two elements. You have the DFS structure that is visible, but you need the, the share on the server itself where it points to. And um, 
when you get this done, you get an object DFS home. And one of the attributes of this DFS uh, name element is just the path that you put to the user, finally, to the new user. And the AD uh, old stuff, ADSI stuff, sure, you need to put it onto the old user also because the server has changed. Working with pathers, talking about this topic. How many of you have heard that it is maybe common to have a dollar sign at the end of a share? Show of hands, are you still awake? Some have. It's very common, isn't it? What do you think? Does PowerShell like it? At the end of a path, a dollar, whatever? PowerShell likes dollars, all right? But uh, there's a little bit of a conflict here. So um, uh, you end up uh, with working around this. And I want to just show you quickly. Uh, we have this my profile path. And we're running out of time here. My profile path has this old share in there. And it needs to be replaced for the new share because we moved to the server. Replacing the server is just a replace operation. But replacing the share is a little bit of an uh, odd thing. You need the path of the new share. Uh, you can check it out and uh, give it to you to, to read it. And then you can use reg uh, escape. And then uh, you can also use the dollar path in that. And then you're fine with replacing one share with another share, including the dollar. Just one of the tricks you may like. So lesson, lessons learned here. There's always room for improvement. I learned a lot in that. We have 16 iterations of this script. Um, this one has definitely over 1,000 lines of code. Don't be too shy to deliver it to the customer. It's your time and your investment in there. And um, infect others. When you have some others infected with this, like I tried to do it today, and I hope I was a little bit of successful here, um, they will come back and try to learn from your code and show you to some, why, why did you do that? And you said, yes, you're right, why did I do that? And then you start up redoing it again with the help of the others. Okay? You are not the best of the best of the best, but uh, uh, reflecting from somebody else may help you then. Don't be shy to look up help. I pointed you to some of the help stuff for the parameters, etc. Really helpful stuff. You may have thought about things and you can borrow from yourself before you go to the internet. I find, hey, I've done this. I've, okay, and then I search through my library. And borrow from yourself is also allowed, but you can also borrow from me or from all the others out in the net. And that concludes my session. And thank you. I think we are on time. And thank you for your attendance. And enjoy PowerShell. Yes, yes, I can run that and uh, prepare it. Software behaves, and I created the, the, the form on the canvas in Visual Studio, and looked up what is available, all the events, and coded it in here. And the source code behind it, when I exit it here, is just this stuff here, and it's available on the internet. You can have it. Uh, you see, it's just the same: presentation framework, system, pathes, get content. You may want to remove the X class attribute um, if you run into that issue. Get the reader, get the form, get the, uh, the, the text blocks in here, the script blocks in here, and then generate your form. It's just a simple thing. And it works, as you've seen here. And in Visual Studio, I don't have Visual Studio open here at the moment, but I will take a little bit more now. I can show it later if you like to. So more questions, please. Um, I think you already mentioned in the web, all from a lot of the code snippets you uh, the code you, you get the presentation, the definitely yeah. from the from the uh, oh, from the yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, uh, and then you have got the I think I put it in, in the last slide the URL where this working sample is. If you don't find it, drop me a line. Is it the first? You see it? It is the first. 
Yeah, in the, in the blue part, there was a link for this working sample. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you have another forest to test it? I didn't get that. You have another forest to test it? Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we have uh, three uh, uh, program one development forest. We have one uh, <coughs> testing area where we go to, to production. And then we have the, the life the system. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's not normal, but uh, I insist. Thank you for attending and uh, yeah, see you later.